Hello there, I'm Paul Miles with the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics, and I'm here with Peter Brummel, who is a biology student who has been researching human origins for several years with Dr. Todd Wood at the Core Academy of Science. And he is speaking today on biblical anthropology and the human fossil record. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. All right, let me uh, pull this up here. Uh, does that look all good on your end? Looks good. All right. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about biblical anthropology and the human fossil record. And specifically, what I want to talk about is exactly how humans have changed over time in the post-flood era. And I'm going to begin this talk by giving a bit of a overview of what creationists have traditionally said about the human fossil record. So what I would kind of characterize as a classic young earth anthropology, and this kind of more traditional young earth creationist view would hold to a few different points. One of these points would be that God created Adam and Eve basically identical to you and me, anatomically that is. So when we look at bone structure, they believe that humans really just hadn't changed at all over time, that since their creation, humans had basically retained the same anatomical features. But when we begin to find human fossils in the mid to late 1800s, it became obvious that there were some interesting and weird fossils of people who looked fairly different from modern people. And so creationists, then have traditionally interpreted that as these small family groups that went out from Babel that were diseased or mutated, or they had some sort of bone disease like rickets, which caused them to look strange or different. But there's some emerging problems with this classic perspective. And I wanna show you a few of these problems. One of these was kind of the growth of baromenology, the study of the created kinds. And in studying created kinds, what we realize is that created kinds were not static. In other words, whether we're looking at horses or giraffes or bears or dogs, these kinds changed over time. And the organisms that Noah would have brought aboard the ark with him were not identical to the modern organisms that descended from them. So let's say, for example, horses. Today's horses, would not have looked identical to the horses that Noah had aboard the ark. So if all of these different created kinds changed so much over time, why would we expect that humans had always remained the same? Another problem was that we realized that these ancient people groups who had these strange and different anatomical features were actually very widespread. Homo erectus, which is one I'll mention in more detail later on, was spread across Africa and Asia, down into Southeast Asia. And we also, depending on which fossils you assign to the species, find them in um, Europe as well. So we have these people groups who are found across the entire old world. Their fossils are found across multiple continents. And that doesn't fit real well with the idea that these are just somehow isolated little families of sick people. We also then realize that People who look exactly like you and me, that we would classify as Homo sapiens, are actually only found very late in the fossil record, up at the very, very top layers. And people who look a little less like us and have some unique anatomical features are actually found lower down, earlier in the fossil record. They're older than people who look exactly like us. So the question is, how do we deal with these observations and understand and fit this into a young earth creationist model, which is bibli biblically consistent. Well, today I wanna to take you through three different ways in which we can evaluate the human fossil record. And then at the end of this presentation, kind of wrap up and summarize a new creationist perspective on exactly how the human fossil record fits with the Bible. So first let's begin by talking a little bit about baromenology. So as I mentioned, 
earlier, dermatology is the study of the created kinds. And what we have come to understand is that these created kinds that God made in the beginning are, one, anatomically distinct from each other. That means that they are not continuous with one another. They have discrete differences which make them um, different from one another. And humans belong to their own created kind. And in uh, Genesis, we hear that soon after making Adam, God brought all the animals to him. And none were found to be the suitable helper for Adam because they were animals. Not only did they lack the image of God, so they were spiritually incompatible with Adam, but they weren't reproductively compatible with him either. Humans are reproductively isolated from other creatures. So using these sorts of principles from the Bible, we can try to look at the fossil record and parse out which fossils we think are human and which are not. And the first way that we want to look at that is through statistical barominology. Now, this is a fancy graph here, and I have not enough time in this presentation to explain to you everything that's going on here. But I want to just simply explain this as what we've done here, this is from a recent study that I did, uh, is look at all of these different anatomical features of an organism's body and compare them across all of these different fossils. And when we do that, we find that there are groups of fossils. And it turns out that chimpanzees and gorillas share a lot of similarities and they seem to belong to their own created kind. What you might think of as ape men, like Lucy, if you've heard of her before, turn out to be their own created kind. But it also turns out that humans, modern humans, are in the same created kind as a bunch of different other human species that we know from the fossil record. So let's take a very brief look at a few of these human species. We're opening up our family scrapbook here and looking at our extinct cousins. Now, on the left here is one you might be familiar with, Neanderthals. Neanderthals lived in uh, Southern Europe, Western Asia, and down into the Middle East. They were shorter and stockier than we are, and their bones are more robust. They are bigger, and they have stronger muscle attachments. They had bigger brains than us. They had a big, heavy ridge of bone called a brow ridge over their eyes, and they were distinct from us in uh, some different ways. On the right here is another type called Homo heidelbergensis, which is very similar to the Neanderthals, and some people think that it's the ancestor of the Neanderthals. There's also some very, very small and strange hominins. On the left here is Homo floresiensis. This fossil comes from Flores in Indonesia, and these individuals, even though they were adult, were only about three and a half feet tall. So they're even smaller than what we might think of as modern pygmy peoples. And they have very strange limb proportions that are different from those that pygmy people would have as well. On the right here, we have Homo naledi, which comes from Southern Africa. It also has a very small brain. Its brain is only the size of an orange. So very, very small people. This on the left is an example of Homo erectus that I mentioned earlier, that one that was very widespread across the old world. Uh, and on the right here, I have an example of early Homo. And this is an example of some of kind of the very earliest fossils of people that we see and, and what they might look like. So let's look at kind of a larger scale pattern. If we look at a map, where exactly do the very first human fossils show up? Well, it turns out that the very first fossil, which can really be reliably assigned to be human, actually shows up down in Southern Africa, in Malawi. That's strange. How does that fit into a creation perspective? Well, we're going to get back to that in just a minute. But first, before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about culture. Culture is another important way in which we can identify humans in the fossil record, right? So the best way to identify humans is not to use one criteria, it's use multiple so that we can have multiple different criteria um, to draw upon the evidence and see if these criteria lead to the same conclusions. So we're trying to look at the fossil record to see what organisms were exhibiting human-like behavior in the past. And it turns out that in the fossil record, we see that Neanderthals, for example, were exhibiting a lot of very human-like behaviors. This is a cave in Spain, for example, where they found these cave paintings, where it appears that Neanderthals specifically 
were using these reddish minerals to draw on the walls of the cave in certain abstract patterns. And this takes quite a high level of cognition to do. We also find evidence that Neanderthals were using stone tools and they were even engraving things. This is a toe bone from a giant deer and you can see that it's been engraved in a specific pattern where all these incisions are at right angles to each other. Well, the, you might not seem so impressive at first. This is actually really cool and it's important because this shows intentional um, decision and planning by the organism that was making this. Here is uh, a structure within a cave. This is a brunical cave. And deep down in this cave, they found these rings of broken stalactites and stalagmites. And it turns out that Neanderthals were going down in this cave and were breaking off these um, stalactites and stalagmites and arranging them in these circular patterns. Once again, this is implying this intention and planning. This is kind of more recent news where we're not exactly sure who was involved in this, but down in Southern Africa and Zambia, we found the oldest wooden structure ever to have been found up to date. And this shows that at this very, very early time, uh, prior to what a lot of anthropologists thought before, humans were already uh, notching logs and fitting them together to make some sort of structures. So generally by looking at the cultural remains that are associated with fossils, we can make arguments about how cognitively advanced these different uh, fossils were and thus help that to determine whether or not they were human. Let's talk a little bit about genetics now. Now, this might seem like a weird one to include, but it turns out, yeah, we actually have the genetic information of Neanderthals and a few other of these fossils as well. So we're not just working solely off bones. I'll get right back to that in a second, but first of all, let's think a little bit, a little bit about mitochondrial Eve. Maybe you've heard this idea of mitochondrial Eve. Now, this stems from the idea that modern humans aren't very genetically diverse. If you look at our DNA, we're all about 99.999% identical. But there are some differences. And basically, this is a tree, which is basically using the differences in um, the mitochondrial DNA, which is a type of DNA in your cells that's passed on from the mother, so in the maternal lineage. And we've been able to make these sorts of trees. And what's interesting about these is that these are all kind of rooted in, they're, sorry, they're unrooted. So what you're sh showing is how all of these different human groups kind of relate to one another. And some people have argued that since humans are not very diverse, that we all go back to a very recent common ancestor. And some have argued that this is evidence that humans recently shared a common ancestor. And some people wanted to argue that you can, can equate that to a biblical woman. But when we look at these mitochondrial phylogenies, something interesting shows up. What you see here on the left is that all of these branches form a kind of nice semicircular arc. But then on the right here, these branches stick way far out to the right. And what that's basically telling us is that these people are very different. They have a lot of mutations compared to these other people on the left. And those branches actually represent African populations. And if you look at the Y chromosome, so the DNA that's passed on through the paternal lineage from father to son, you'll see something similar. The Africans happen to have very, very divergent um, sequences. So what's going on here? Well, when we look at, we, we need to really compare this in a bigger picture to the fossil record. And it turns out we have Neanderthal DNA, as I mentioned. In fact, if you go to 23andMe.com, what you'll find out is that you can get your DNA analyzed and see how much percentage Neanderthal you have inside of you. Now, when we put Neanderthals on a phylogeny, we have humans, this is what we see. Now, what you're looking at here is a tree which includes chimpanzees and humans, which are living humans, which are indicated by this gray box here, and then some extinct varieties of humans like Neanderthals, Denisovans, and then Homo heidelbergensis. And what's important here is that you'll see that all living humans fall inside of this gray box in terms of diversity. 
But Neanderthals and Denisovans are actually very different. They, you have to go on this tree back multiple steps to get to these branches where Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo heidelbergensis branch off. So they are very different from us. And that's very strange. So what does this all mean? Well, what's going on here, it turns out, is that mitochondrial Eve is only the ancestor of all living people. So mitochondrial Eve does not probably equate to some biblical Eve, certainly, or to a bottleneck that happened at the flood. Instead, what we're looking at here is the ancestor of people who look like us. But when we're actually looking at our, our family tree and trying to reconstruct it, we have to be more expansive. We can't just look at live, the ancestor of all living people. We need to look at the ancestor of all people, living and fossil. And when we do that, we realize that our the last common ancestor of all humans is back past mitochondrial Eve and has to be down further on the phylogeny. So let's think finally about fitting this into a biblical perspective. Here's our time frame, right? So if we're working on the Masoretic chronology, we don't have a whole lot of time between the flood and Abraham. And this seems to be this period in which all of these fossils fit. Curiously, no fossils of humans come from flood layers. And that could be its whole own conversation, but unfortunately, we don't have time for that today. So why? how exactly does the human fossil record fit into this time period? Well, first, what we have to recognize is that people landed the Ark on the mountains of Ararat. Now, we don't know exactly where the mountains of Ararat are. Um, it's possible that it equates to the modern mountains of Ararat generally, um, but we're not entirely sure. But people migrated from the mountains of Ararat to Babel. But it's likely that at this time, Homo sapiens did not exist. Now, that's a kind of surprising thing to say to some of you, probably. But the fossil record indicates that the very earliest people were not anatomically identical to us. And so instead, a uh, human form, possibly more like Homo erectus that we talked about earlier, was perhaps the dominant form at this time. So Noah and his descendants and ancestors may have had large brow ridges of slightly smaller brains than us and some other features that would have set them apart from us. And at Babel, the culture of humanity was fragmented, right? They were first living together in a community, but at Babel, their languages were divided. They could no longer communicate and they were spread out. And what appears to have happened is that as all these different people spread out into this, um, spread out into the new world after the flood, they diversified and they adapted to their environment in much the same way that many different created kinds did. Um, Neanderthals, for example, seem to have adapted specifically to the cold environments of Europe because they were living during the Ice Age. Uh, and certain things about their body proportions seem to indicate that they were uh, well suited for living in the cold. But all of these different types of humans went out and covered the earth and adapted to these different environments. But curiously, many of them went extinct. In fact, all of them went extinct except us, Homo sapiens. And we don't know exactly why that was. But generally, this is kind of our new working model of exactly how we can understand human origins from a creationist perspective. We think that rather than Homo sapiens being the dominant human form, that Homo sapiens is actually a later form that developed after Babel. And when all of these other human species went extinct, Homo sapiens then became dominant and perhaps about that time finally began building cities and then we get to the time of Abraham. So let me get back to this. How do we explain the distribution of human fossils around the world? Well, I think that we have to take some biblical factors into consideration here. One is that humans at this time were living for very long periods of time, meaning that they were living for hundreds of years, right? And so we shouldn't necessarily expect to find the very first human fossils right around Babel or right around the mountains of Ararat. So humans were able to travel very, very far away from Babel before they would ever die and become fossilized. And the second thing is that when you look at these, these are dates in the millions of years, which I obviously don't accept, but we can use them relatively. 
meaning that something that's dated at 2 million years is probably older than something that's dated at 1 million years, but not actually a million years older, just older. And what we can see here then is that, yeah, these dates are, humans do appear a little bit earlier in Africa than in some other places, but it seems that actually the larger pattern here is that humans basically appear almost simultaneously when we have to compress this uh, chronology to a young Earth chronology, they almost appear simultaneously across the old Earth. And so that is how I believe that we can understand the human fossil record from a biblical perspective. So just to summarize a few things, our new models suggest that humans actually have changed a lot over time, that people, as they encountered new environments after the flood, rapidly adapted to them and became different from other neighboring populations. And that it appears that actually multiple human species coexisted after Babel, but for some reason, Homo sapiens eventually became the dominant one. And with that, I'll uh, close and we can have some questions. Thank you so much, Peter. That's very interesting stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Now, whenever I uh, look at uh, depictions of Adam and Eve or Noah, they have, uh, they're always drawn as Homo sapiens. What I'm hearing here, though, is that they probably were not. Yeah, I, I think it's very difficult from uh, when you're looking at the fossil to argue that Homo sapiens is the um, was the original human form. When we look at those dates, um, what you saw on there, 2.4 million years, I believe, was the radiometric date for the oldest human fossil. If you, we, we look at the radiometric date for the oldest Homo sapiens fossil, so someone who looks identical to us, that's around 300,000 years. Now, obviously, those dates aren't yeah. technically correct, but even relatively, that seems to be a long kind of discrepancy. So if Homo sapiens were the original human form, we would expect to see fossils of them way down at the bottom before we see fossils of early Homo and Homo erectus. But the, that that's not the case indicates that Homo sapiens was not the original human form. It makes sense to me. Is what's the uh, the rest of the creationist community uh, thinking on this topic? Is there a lot of agreement or disagreement? Is it controversial? It's a very contentious subject. Um, okay. One because there's a lot of disagreement yet about exactly which fossils are human and which are not. There's a general core that most people agree on, but there's some like Australopithecus sediba here that are very, very widely disputed. And a lot of creationists don't think this is human. Uh, some studies that I've worked on have suggested that this might be human. Um, but going from there, the idea that there are hmm. seem to be having some technical difficulties. Oh, dear. It seems we have lost Peter there. Okay. <laughs> well, it's the end of our time. Anyway, uh, this has been Peter Brummel speaking on uh, humans in the fossil record. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in.